So as I said, this is an introductory session, and it's one that you can present in a dumbed-down version to people who are not technically trained. So please don't feel um, insulted if it's very easy for you. Um, but it's, it's trying to get us all on the same page, because we come from different angles. Um, and so I wanted to, to just start with something quite, quite general. Um, the book and I should mention that we are now teaching a little bit from a book which Schumann, Paola, James Foster, Maria Santos, Jose Manuel Roche um, uh, wrote together uh, on multidimensional poverty measurement and analysis. So we begin with this line from Les Miserables, I live under a roof of falling tiles. <coughs> that line comes from a man, Busoe, um, who experienced homelessness, health deprivations, a low income, a joblessness, and so he knew that different deprivations were going to strike him, but he never knew quite when they were going to hit. But there's also quite a lovely description of Boussoe's life, and, and so this is in a sense why we chose it, because it didn't portray him as this you know, passive victim um, of his life, or of cunning development programs, as Amartya Sen would say. But Victor Hugo describes him as somebody who accepted ill luck ser serenely and smiled at the pinpricks of destiny, like a man who is listening to a good joke. He was poor, but his wallet of good temper was inexhaustible. When adversity entered his room, he bowed to his old acquaintance cordially. He tickled catastrophes in the ribs and was so familiar with fatality as to call it by a nickname. These persecutions of fate had rendered him inventive, and we better not go into the details of what that meant. He didn't live a morally impeccable life. Um, but I do that because, in a sense, it's also showing Boussoué as somebody who also had positive qualities of good temper, um, of a, you know, a sense of humor with life, um, and an ongoing um, creativity. Many of you will be familiar with the Voices of the Poor study from 1990 and 2000, done by Deepan Ryan, Robert Chambers, and a group of people at the World Bank and other places. Um, what they did was, for 20 countries and about 20,000 people, they gathered new data. And for 40 countries and 40,000 people, they reanalyzed participatory data. And these data had taken in these data, facilitators had gone to the communities and said, who is poor in this community? And then invited the people whose neighbors identified them as poor and asked them if they considered themselves poor. And they gathered together the people who both were considered by their communities and themselves considered themselves to be poor. And then they asked, in a sense, what is ill-being and what is well-being? And I was working at the World Bank on the office next to Dean Ryan at that time. Um, and so this is just fascinating to see how it, it came out. And so they used, you know, quotations to make public presentations. They were using nudist software to analyze the threads of the qualitative data when these had been translated into English and see what were the themes that came up about Ilbi when people described it. Um, so the quotes obviously are anecdotal and not representative. Um, but they add color if you're presenting to people who don't like numbers. So, um, those without money have to wait. Our parents did not go to school, so we are poor today in awareness of social mobility. I'm afraid they might kill my son for something as irrelevant as a snack, just the fragility and violence, uh, threat of violence. Um, so when they did the proper um, assessment of the threads, they found different dimensions of poverty, and that in a sense was the, the breakthrough of that study, that it was health, it was lack of food, it was psychological dimensions, which also came up, obviously, infrastructure, education, jobs, assets, um, uh, and also gender. And the two surprising dimensions which came up in that study were humiliation, um, that came out very strongly from the qualitative work and hadn't been certainly on the radar screen of the World Bank or, or actors at that time, and violence, violence which was endemic to the experience of the poor, but certainly it was always in a different silo of development assistance and not related to poverty work. Um, 
And so, but it's this work that, um, this is one study of many kinds of studies that have been qualitative, um, and it's one of the motivations of work on multidimensional poverty, um, that if poverty has these different dimensions, then an adequate measure of poverty, which is trying to galvanize political force to fight poverty, should in a sense reflect these different aspects of poverty. I think that's on the same page. It's interesting to know a little bit of the background. Um, and then just to zoom forward to now, you probably have heard of the My World Survey. How many of you have done the My, My World Survey? Okay, so some of you. Um, the My World Survey, <laughs> maybe not. Seven million voices doesn't include yours. I was online this morning, and there were 7.7 million and 428 votes on the survey today. If you go to myworlds.something. Um, and this was a survey that was, in a sense, engineered by uh, part of the UN that wanted citizen input into the sustainable development goals that will be agreed in September at the United Nations General Assembly. And they really wanted to know what people um, valued at this time. Um, they didn't only interview poor people, um, but they did have national consultations, thematic consultations, as well as this survey. So they did get into communities that wouldn't have internet access. Um, and how the, the My World, the online survey, works is it has listed 16 topics, and you can choose six. So it's very simplistic. It's gimmicky. But you know, it, it, it just was a way to try to um, get a sense of, of diversity of, of ideas. And so this is today's tally. Um, and you can do these online. They change every day. But the order is about the same. I was looking back to when this was 500,000. Now it's 5 million. Good education was number one then, and it remains number one now. Better health care, number two. Better jobs, number three. Honest and responsive government, number four. Affordable and nutritious food, number five. Crime and violence, number six. So these are some of the 16. Again, it's very fixed, very cookie cutter, um, but it, it gives an idea of the priorities, which is quite interesting. Um, and you can't take it very seriously, but it's, it's the current, you know, Voices of the Poor type survey, which is trying to visualize um, priorities that resonate with a sector of the population. And what they are, in a sense, selling this as is representing the voices of youth. Because although um, many people are not connected to the internet, they figure that most of the people who answered the survey are probably under 30. Um, and so this might be more showing their perspectives. So this is, in a sense, um, I think a starting point you will have your own starting points from your countries, from your literatures. But there's lots of um, ways of trying to say, well, poverty is multidimensional. And we'll be talking later about the normative approach, about Amartya Sen's approach. And that is another conceptual framework for thinking about it. You could think about Ubuntu. You could think about human rights. You could think about social cohesion, social exclusion, social protection, the, the socials. Um, and, and there are other conceptual frameworks to call on. Um, but however we may come to this, and even if we recognize poverty as multidimensional, there are questions as to whether we need a measure of poverty to be multidimensional, or whether we can find a simpler measure, make our lives simple, and um, do a proxy with income, do a proxy with consumption, do a proxy with girls' education, or some other bellwether indicator. So what we're going to focus on now is really investigating um, why there is an interest in measuring multidimensional poverty, um, and not just in recognizing that it's a multidimensional phenomenon, and then jumping to a proxy like income to reflect it. So um, <laughs> there are basically three reasons that, in a sense, um, multidimensional measures seem to be on the upswing. One kind of reasons are more technical. They can be constructed on our laptops with existing data sets um, to a high standard. Um, the second is empirical. Um, having looked at the data and seen are there good proxies for the level or for the trend or for a policy that would reduce poverty in all its dimensions, there doesn't seem to be one proxy in terms of level, one proxy in terms of trend, or one policy that reduces the different facets of poverty together. 
And so we're going to go through that empirical information, which is new and which we didn't know um, a, a few years ago. And the third is policy, um, that the measures do meet policy demands. And you'll hear more about that when we move to national and PI examples. But we'll hear a little bit about that today with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and and as there was no other time to mention them, so I'll mention that toward the end this morning. I can't count. So this slide has eight, and some slides have nine. So please forgive me. But um, I'm just going to go through some of the different steps, and sometimes I'll add a number seven after economic growth and non-income. But I'm just going to go through, in a sense, some of the motivations for uh, interest in multidimensional measures. And I think the first is something I didn't know when I studied, which is how recent the household survey data sets are. So if we start with that, the World Bank began the LSMS surveys. Does anybody know what year that was? Anyone know? 80s? Yeah. Yeah, it was in the 80s. How about the demographic and health surveys? Anyone know or mix? Yeah. 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 Mix in 2014. Yeah. Great. Mix for sin. Ah, I didn't know that. Um, so basically, the LSMS started in 1985. DHS had a precursor. Um, but uh, its, its internationally comparable version started after that, and MIX only started in 1995. So if we start first with um, household budget surveys, um, surveys that gather consumption or income um, and that are used um, for comparing com comparable work. Um, and this is in a paper with all the, the micro ba back ends of, of the surveys that we've inputted. What you can see is that there was not very much, and these are for de developing countries, not very much by 1980. And 1985 is really when it started to pick up, um, and, and that there's an increment uh, of that shape. So the number of countries that have um, monetary surveys <coughs> for developing countries is now nearly 150, 141, I believe. And then if we look at multidimensional surveys, <coughs> You can see that, in a sense, um, they haven't reached 800 because they've started later and the increment has been more slow. So they um, are at an earlier point, in a sense, in their trajectory um, than the monetary ones. And the, this axis, I wanted to make the axis the same. This axis goes to 800, not 900. Um, and again, it's a few fewer countries. I think it's 127. Um, uh, and this paper is a year old. Um, but that gives you an, exam an idea that. Basically, it's been, you know, since 2005, uh, we've had a lot of increment. And so in terms of the ability to do time series studies with repeated cross-section data, um, there's, there's really a lot more in the public domain. Now, what surveys underlie the multidimensional one? It's the QUIC, the Core Welfare Indicators Questionnaire, Demographic and Health Surveys, um, a, an international one, the LSMS mix, PAPFAM for, I think, 17 countries. Um, and so we basically counted countries that had any of those internationally comparable surveys. This does not include national surveys. And national surveys, as you will know, are the key um, tool for national MPI. So the key tool that's really valued inside countries. Um, and so I, I want to say that this is very illustrative and it's simply looking at comp broadly comparable kinds of surveys. So they're by no means completely comparable. Um, but there has been an increase in national surveys um, since about the same time. So the um, McCovey surveys in Latin America were sort of the beginning in, in, in that region, and other regions have had um, uh, national surveys um, coming up differently. Then the other part is obviously there are computational differences. So um, in 1989, the amount of computer power that's required for a PlayStation 2 would have you know, needed a, um, something on top of a building. It would have been just huge. And so the fact that we have and can run these things on our, our laptops um, was impossible uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so that is, I think, a big reason that these computations are much, much easier now than previously. 
Um, and then there are a lot of methodological developments, which we'll be going through, Shimon and I, tomorrow morning. Um, and so just to, to focus not on the methodological developments, but instead on a few examples. Um, remember that the Human Development Index was launched in 1990. And then since that time, there has been, in terms of composite indices, um, a lot of uh, other indicators that have come out and that are we're not going to talk about in this course further. But there's been a proliferation not only in terms of multidimensional poverty measures, but also in terms of composite poverty measures or um, and well-being, gendered, governance, um, peace-related, uh, terrorism-related, the new GTI, um, and so on the happiness ones. So in a sense, the increase in multidimensional poverty measures, which are not technically composite, as I'll explain later, is part of a, a phenomenon of increasing multidimensional measures in different domains. But the difference is that the multidimensional measures, as we'll talk about at some length, um, look at and build from the micro level, look at the joint distribution, which most of the other indices do not. And then there is also, in a sense, a bit of an appeal of the methodologies that have an axiomatic background, um, which we will look at. Um, and we would just mention that um, at, at this point that we're focusing on poverty measures in this course, but we've been interested to observe applications of the methodology we are teaching that apply to energy, corruption, resilience, time use, well-being, empowerment, health, um, and, and other dimensions. And so there, the methodology that we are teaching can, of course, be applied in other sectors. <coughs> I was just talking to somebody from KPMG who's trying to, to think of business applications of the methodology. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't decide to engage. So I'm just going to begin, um, do about 15 minutes on this, and then we'll break. Um, so... Because income and consumption poverty are the regnant measure of poverty, the question is whether they proxy other indicators. And you might think they do. Aren't income poor households the ones in which the head of household is not educated? Aren't they the ones in which there are, they don't have enough money for food? And so one would expect there to be malnutrition in the households because you set often your food poverty line is part of your poverty line. Um, you might think that the uh, deprivations in housing, if a person has money, then of course they would build a better house. They would have more assets. Um, they would have electricity. They would um, have good water and good sanitation because they could put those things into their household. And so if you think about it, you might assume that actually income poverty would be a good proxy for deprivations in other spaces. That's certainly what I was taught when I did my DPhil in economics in the 1990s. <laughs> um, that was the teaching, that income is a good proxy for deprivations in these other dimensions. I was taught that based on basically correlations of aggregate data, because we didn't have these micro data sets um, in the public domain freely accessible to the extent that we do now. But the only way to answer that is not to go to your ideology, but to go to the data and do very, very simple um, construction of deprivation indicators and associations or cross tabs. And I'll begin with this slide because it was, in a sense, this, the table in a book of my supervisor, Francis Stewart, one of my supervisors, that got me interested in the topic. Caterina Ruggeri Laderki, um, who um, did her doctorate at the same time and worked at the bank. Um, she worked, looked at the case of Peru, Ruhi Saif at India, um, Susanna Franco at some other countries as well. And they found a mismatch um, between monetary poverty and what they called capability poverty. But really what it means in this is that um, for children, it's children out of school. For adults, it's adults who are illiterate. For children, it's children who are malnourished. And for adults, it's adults who don't have access to health care. So what does this mean? It means that 43% of children who were out of school did not belong to households that were poor in monetary terms. 
in India. And one third of children who were out of school were not living in income poor households in Peru. And flipping that around, looking at the positive side, they found that in India, 65% of the children who were living in income poor households were going to school. And 93% of children in Peru who were living in income poor households were going to school. And just to continue with children, this is the easy one to remember, 53% of malnourished children in that study were not living in income poor households, which was a big surprise. And on the positive side, 53% of children living in income poor households were not malnourished. Now for a person who's been taught that income poverty and malnutrition walk step by step because we are using the food poverty line, this comes as a bit of a shock and certainly awakening and certainly makes you curious as to why this is and we need qualitative data to know why. And I'd love somebody to tell me uh, with more qualitative data. Um, but it also means that we perhaps need to explore this question more. Now moving over into Europe, um, there has also since the late 60s, early 70s been a literature on counting and they've been particularly interested not in anything as dramatic or revolutionary as health or education, but in the relationship between income poverty and asset poverty, which they call material deprivation. So um, these studies have been done um, by some of these authors since the 1990s. Um, and if you want a review of this, I really recommend Brian Nolan and Chris Whelan's 2011 book, Poverty and Deprivation in Europe, which lays them all out. Um, and we learned a great deal in writing our book about that literature from their book. Um, but let me explain this. This was now using um, panel data, the ECHP, European Community Household Panel Survey. And they identified somebody as persistently income poor. They knew from the European literature by then about these mismatches. They knew that people who were income poor were not asset poor and vice versa. Um, so they thought, well, maybe it's a, a, a problem of lag. Maybe it's that if you're income poor in this period, then you'll be asset poor in the next period. So looking at simultaneous snapshots is bringing in disturbances. So they said, okay, let's call you persistently poor if you were deprived in three out of the past five periods. And so they found that roughly over these nine countries, 20% of people were persistently income poor, and 20% of these people were persistently deprived in material assets, which are things like not being able to go on um, a, a holiday, not being able to eat meat, fish, or the vegetarian equivalent, not being able to um, have more than one pair of shoes, not owning a washing machine, um, those kinds of asset variables, things that with good market penetration in Europe, money can buy. So about 20% of people were poor in both across these countries. But what they found, sorry, were, were poor in each of these. But they found that only 9.7% were both income poor persistently and materially deprived persistently. So only half. And they found that half of the people were always deprived in assets, but they had income. Maybe it was disability, maybe it was in addiction, maybe they didn't have a good sense of sales and couldn't get, get things together so well. And 10% were persistently poor in income, but they had these assets. They, had these, they were not deprived in a material sense. And so this, again, in 2004, this created a, a big discussion in Europe about why are there these mismatches? And the Whelan and Nolan Whelan book you know, really fleshed that out in, in great detail. Um, so this conversation, you know, if you fast forward it forward till now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the EU 2020 Poverty Index. Um, but um, Europe 2020 now <coughs> reports every year from Eurostat, the multidimensional index of poverty. And the multidimensional index of poverty is the union of three indicators. And they've changed a little bit since they first um, released it. Um, but the three indicators are at risk of po income poverty. This is a relative income poverty measure, AROP, if you ever see the acronym in other slides. AROP is the income poverty measure. 
Uh, material deprivation, it's an index that Anne Catarina Diu did. Um, there's one version before 2009, and another version has recently been accepted uh, for severe material deprivation by Eurostat. And then the third is joblessness, now called quasi-worklessness. Um, but it's a combination of unemployment and underemployment um, and discouraged un unemployment. Um, and so these are the, this is a, an early, this is from the Atkinson 2010 paper that in a sense um, launched the, the measure in Europe. Um, and these are the percentage, no, these are the millions of people um, who experience the different kinds of deprivations. And what you see is that again, the intersection, the people who have all three kinds of deprivations is a small minority of those who experience one or the other. And so this is an example also of a Venn diagram looking at the overlapping deprivations in a visual term. So the whole European measure is the union of these. Um, but clearly by this Venn diagram, you can see who's poor in just one, in two, <coughs> and in all three at the same time. And so if you go on the Eurostat website, um, you will see that for each country. Um, it draws on the EU Silk data set. Um, and uh, the EU Silk data set has both panel and cross-sectional versions. Um, in some countries, it uses registry data. In others, uh, household survey data. But I think this is a good example of how just the observation of mismatch between income poverty and material deprivation then created a curiosity that gave birth to a regional measure um, of, a, of a very simple type, but I think quite a powerful type. Um, and then, of course, there are other issues. And if we had had a session um, on the construction of the welfare aggregate, we would have gone into this a little bit more. But there are also some, some other considerations with income measures that um, are treated differently than some of the measures of direct deprivation that we'll be talking about here. Um, particularly, Angus Deaton would say that the non-sampling measurement error of the monetary indicators can be quite high. Um, and it may be that the non-sampling measurement error of some of these other more direct deprivations um, may be lower. It's an interesting research topic. I don't know if it's true. Um, it's, it's a hunch that he had, um, but it would be an interesting research topic to go into further. Clearly, the time and the cost of survey is, is important um, because the consumption and expenditure surveys take quite a bit of time in the field. There have been many attempts to have shortened consumption modules. Maybe some of you have, have done some of the research, but we don't yet have a 15-minute consumption expenditure survey that seems to be accurate enough. Um, and it can be possible in census data and on census instruments to have some kind of, rep, you know, at least passable data quality uh, for some of these other dimensions. And then there are different issues of comparability. Everything has comparability issues. Um, a multidimensional measure or an income poverty measure uh, or consumption, a monetary poverty measure, but they're different. And in particular, um, the rural urban price differences are much more difficult in terms of monetary poverty measures, um, whereas for multidimensional poverty measures, it's really what is urban poverty, and what is rural poverty, and what indicators constitute it. And Chugat and Chumon's work is a good exploration of urban poverty. And maybe we need overcrowding, maybe we need uh, waste disposal as a much more important indicator in urban areas than rural. So thinking through comparability is always important. But in international terms, um, obviously, a monetary measure has purchasing power parity needs, and a measure of malnutrition or a multidimensional measure that has years of schooling and nutrition at some level doesn't need any translation. A child of a low body mass index by WHO standards, we believe, is malnourished, whatever country it happens to be living in, when you put in um, the reference groups. Um, of course, you can say, well, the quality of education differs. And so if somebody could come up with a nice quality of education survey uh, question, then that would be fantastic. Um, and then the other observation is that even if income were a good proxy of these other deprivations, you might not know which particular deprivations a person suffered. So you might not know, was that a household where the person was, had, didn't have a good education? Even if you knew that they were 
deprived in other dimensions. You wouldn't know necessarily quite which ones. So we'll go on into that when we talk about how, in fact, national governments are using um, the dimensions of a multidimensional measure. So um, with the Millennium Development Goals since 1990 to 2015, um, they have, of course, developed some standardized MDG indicators. And um, it's a lovely way of obtaining data from WDI. Thank you very much. We're very much users of the WDI database. Um, <laughs> to um, look at trends in non-monetary poverty and trends in the dollar twenty-five a day measures. Um, so I'll just give this example. It's uh, from a paper that first came out as a working paper for the European Development Bank and then was published in the Ruby Kungor and Michael Spence. It's Michael Spence, I think, not Spencer, um, book. Um, and what they did was they reviewed the trends in the different Millennium Development Goals for as many countries as they could get data from 1990 to 2006. And they looked at the, the trends of reduction of those indicators. And they looked at the trends in $1.25 a day monetary poverty. And the question we would ask is that maybe the same, maybe it's not that they're the same levels or the same people, but maybe when you reduce income poverty, you reduce children out of school. Maybe when you reduce income poverty, you reduce malnutrition. Okay, so maybe the trends happen together. And if so, then we can look at the trends in income poverty measure and go home, and we don't need uh, to stay and worry more about multidimensional. So these are the graphics, uh, um, and here is the growth or the, the change in undernourishment, um, primary education completion, female male enrollment in secondary school, and underweight. And here is the change in $1.25 a day headcount ratios. And so if they were perfectly correlated, you would see something like this. Um, and it's actually not beautiful. This is the one that's significant. And they talked about it quite a lot, but they decided that it was a, an anomaly because every other malnutrition versus income poverty measure like undernourishment or stunting um, didn't go along this uh, wasty. So they decided that what it, it simply happened. But the others were very much scatter plots. And so again, what we are seeing here is that when you, you know, Pakistan had a very strong reduction in income poverty, $1.25 a day, but zero change in undernourishment. Or Mauritania had a strong reduction in income poverty, but a very minor improvement in primary school education. Um, and so they, they're not going along in the same directions. So this doesn't mean that we can take the reduction of income poverty and presume that we can guess the rate of reduction of multidimensional poverty from it. Or, or of, of, not multidimensional poverty, of non-monetary dimension reduction um, from, from income poverty. And then they also, um, these are a few more indicators. This is with income <coughs> poverty and under five mortality. But then they also looked at the indicators among each other. So this is under five mortality and the gender ratios in secondary education or primary education and gender ratios or under five mortality and primary education. And what they found was, again, it's an empirical puzzle. We would have expected these much more to be correlated, to, to move together um, than they in fact found. And so we thought, well, maybe that's because they were looking 1990 to 2006 a lot of countries didn't have data um, at, at, until partway into that period. Um, so maybe we just have to let the clock roll a little bit further. So in chapter one of our book, we present an updated analysis where we went from 1990 to 2012. And we also make, made better scatter plots with the population size. <laughs> Um, just so that you appreciate this beautiful work. Um, and so in all of these is the income poverty headcount ratio by the dollar twenty-five a day, and the reduction with the axes um, it is faster down here. And then these are the change in under five mortality, in gender parity, primary completion, and child malnutrition. And so you see, again, we're not getting a strong correlation. The closest is child malnutrition, but there's quite a bit of noise. And the size of the bubble is the 2,000 population. So what we are learning from this is that these trends don't walk together. Um, and information is added by looking at other variables. 
Um, and so that seems to answer our question of whether we can use trends as a proxy in the negative. So let's go a little bit further into these non-monetary deprivations. Yep. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, I assume it has, but have you looked at these kind of things with regressions and accounting for a bunch of other variables? And, yeah. Other than the In, I just yeah, these are very, very crude. Yeah. These are just <laughs> descriptive. Yeah. And work in progress. Okay. Yeah. Um, so associations across non-monetary deprivations. Um, going back to the Bourguignon, uh, uh, Bourguignon et al. slides where they were looking at the different indicators vis-a-vis -vis each other. It might be that income poverty doesn't track other dimensions, but it might be that one indicator is a good reflection of the others. Um, and so let's, let's <coughs> look at that a little bit more. Let's, and for example, there, Lawrence Haddad <coughs> at IDS Sussex said, we just need a bellwether indicator. Let's try girls' education. Can't we just choose one indicator that we think is really pivotally important and that's a good predictor of the other indicators um, in level and trend? And why don't we try to look for that? And so we've tried to look for that. Again, because um, economists always want parsimony. We want the least information that we require, um, but the most that we need at the same time. So. Let's just start with one country and one example. So this is the NFHS3 data set in India. And we're using MPI indicators. And so 25% of households, people live in a household where a child has died. And 18% of households live in a household where nobody has five years of schooling. And we would accept, expect a high association because uneducated parents may not know to breastfeed the children, may not know to give clean water, to boil the water, they may not know the proper prevention of infectious disease. But when we do a simple cross tab with weights, and you'll be doing this yourself, um, we see that only 5.8% of the population of people live in households that have both lost a child and have nobody in the household who is deprived in, or who has achieved more than five years of schooling. So in 20% of the population, they live in a household where a child has died, but somebody in the household has more than five years of schooling. Um, and so that's a mismatch. And then if you look at child mortality and school attendance, again, there's quite a sizable mismatch. And so we, we do this, and you will do this, and it's useful to do the cross-tabulations um, between the different indicators. But let's try to summarize it. Um, in some other ways. I'll begin with this. So if we look at 75 countries, um, uh, the average percentage of people in the household who had not completed, in the country, who had not completed five years of schooling was 17.7. <coughs> and on average, 19.3% of people lived in a household where a child was not attending school. So these are both education indicators you would expect their overlap <coughs> to be quite high. In fact, on average across the countries, 7.3% of people lived in a household, both with nobody with five years of schooling and a child not attending school. So you can look at this table, um, which uh, Shimon made, and which summarizes a great deal of, of information uh, across these 75 countries, and um, see that the match is never complete. So this is the highest match, 12% of, out of the 17.7% of households, of people um, live in households with asset poverty and nobody completing five years of schooling. Um, and the others are lower. So these are the simple cross tabs. But what we're seeing in terms of our quest for a bellwether indicator is that in terms of these, when these are 17.7, this is 19.3. If there was perfect overlap, this would be 17.7, right? everybody would be deprived in this, and then there's a couple extras over here. Or this would be 17.7, because that's higher. Um, and, and so, but you're not seeing that. And so we're not finding a bellwether indicator. Okay, um, now going back to the multiple deprivations. Um, we'll present this more, so this is a little bit off topic for where we are, but I wanted to put it in, because it's also in, in chapter one. Um, 
And it's the, right now we're just looking at one deprivation at a time. So for example, if you look at Brazil um, in 1995 and 2006, this is how much deprivation in shelter decreased, or children in school, or running water, or income, or sanitation, or education of the household. So this could be a dashboard of different indicators. But we don't know if all of the people who are deprived in shelter are also deprived in everything else, or if they are only deprived in shelter. And then you could, in a sense, that everybody's deprived in one thing, or you can see visually it'll be maybe two things in some cases. <coughs> so this is the new information that we are going to add when we move to multidimensional poverty, which is to look who's deprived in exactly one indicator at the same time, who's deprived in exactly two at the same time, three, four, five, six, and how does this change over time? So we'll go into this quite a bit, as that, this is in a sense the value added of the multidimensional approach that we're doing, which is looking at overlapping dimensions, the number you experience at the same time. Um, but let me go back to my quest for the indicators. Um, again, let's look at the trends. Um, in the non-monetary, this is the trend in income poverty for the different <coughs> countries in terms of the MDGs. So the MDG <coughs> indicator was met in 64 countries, um, and there was sufficient progress in just under 80, insufficient progress in some, moderately off target, seriously off target, and insufficient data in those. And you can see just visually that the, the patterns across the other indicators that we have listed here are quite different. Um, and so it's also not the same in terms of trends. Um, of course, these are not, in a sense, strictly comparable because what it <coughs> takes to meet the income poverty measure might have been easier than what it took to meet the infant mortality measure. Um, but at least we, we can see that in a very crude way, the patterns seem to be different. Um, and so, again, this, this is, in an introductory sense, it makes us curious about the levels and trends of indicators and how they move together, complementing what I showed you in, in, the, in the very descriptive scatter plot of Bergino et al. So then, let's move back. We've talked about levels, we've talked about trends. Let's move back to policy. Because it could be that these levels and these trends are different, but that the same policy, and in particular economic growth, is going to lead to a change in both of the indicators. And so in a sense, Let's forget the measurement. Let's really focus on policies. Let's focus on getting growth right. And then, however we measure poverty, we know it will go down. Okay? So that would be the third hypothesis we're going to look at. And then now this slide has the little bit that I added in, which is adding in a bit on MPI and income poverty. Um, and let's start from a very strong position. You probably know that in 2005, the World Bank released a landmark report on um, measuring growth in the 1990s. And that reviewed the progress of growth and of the structural adjustment policies and the different policies <coughs> that were intended to construct growth in different developing countries. They looked to the extent that the countries implemented the recommended policies. And they also looked at the growth outcomes. And it was a landmark report because, again, they found some surprises. And they found that some of the countries that had grown best had not implemented the Washington Consensus Policies, and some of those that seemed to have implemented them the best had not seen the promised growth. And so it really led to a, a serious curiosity about what makes for growth. So then Michael Spence led a, the Growth Commission that released this report in 2008. And the Growth Commission identified countries that had grown at more than 7% per annum and maintained that rate of growth for more than 25 years. Okay, so high rates of growth, 7% or higher for more than 25 years, found 13 countries that had done it. And so then they said, well, why? How did these countries grow? And it found 10 ingredients of growth that there was not one recipe, in a sense, if, if you're into baking, which I am. Uh, uh, there wasn't one way of putting these ingredients together, but there, there were common strategies across the different countries that seemed to promote growth. What was interesting about that report for me, um, and the night before it was launched in the UK, uh, we had a, a, 
a little bit of a, a foretaste into it, was its claims that were actually not empirically validated, but that were made very strongly about the links between growth and poverty and drudgery. And it said growth is not an end in itself, but it makes it possible to achieve other important objectives of individuals and societies. It can spare people en masse from poverty and drudgery. Nothing else ever has. And so that's, that's a quite a strong claim. And in a sense, the claim seems to be realized in that if you look at high-income countries, they don't have the levels of poverty of low- and, and middle-income countries. And so there's, a, there's a, a sense in which that's true. But if you are in the ditches, as it were, in the middle of the story, um, it, it's interesting to know a little bit more detail how that works. Um, so just to go back first to some of the studies that they did, one of the high growth countries was Indonesia, another Botswana, another Oman. So it just looked a little bit um, at those countries. And after 25 years of growth in Indonesia, and I tried, but I couldn't get the initial levels of these malnutrition um, 25 years before. I couldn't find data sources for them. Maybe somebody can help me. Um, but 28% uh, of kids were underweight and 42% were stunted. This was at, in 2008. It's not now. I know it's gone down now. In Botswana, um, there was high nutrition across the population. And because of the AIDS epidemic at that time, the HDI rank had also plummeted. And then in Oman, the gender parity was, was a little bit imbalanced in terms of earnings. And other countries with lower growth had made interesting progress in social indicators. So one, again, wants to go further, wants to explore this a little bit more. And so um, a good place to start, um, which is also a good read if you haven't read it. How, how many have read An Uncertain Glory, Indian Its Contradictions? So it, it's, it's a good book by Amartya Sen and Jean Dres. Um, and it's, it's a quick read, um, but, but I think quite worth doing. Um, and that's a happy picture when it was launched. Um, but this is a table that we've updated um, from their book, Chapter 2. And what they are doing is they're comparing India with Bangladesh and Nepal. And India had grown much faster, 7% per annum on average between 1990 and 2011, whereas Bangladesh was 5% and Nepal 3%. So what you can see is that India's GDP per capita had more than doubled. Um, Bangladesh's was at that point half of what India's was, and Nepal's was lower. And then they looked at the changes in non-monetary measures. And I should say, it, I think it's unquestionable that growth affects income poverty with varying elasticities, but there's a clear relationship and it's well documented. So at the beginning, um, India's under mortality rate was, under five mortality rate, 114 children died per thousand, and they had reduced it to 61. But Bangladesh, had started with a higher rate of under five mortality of 139 and reduced it more to one, only 46. And similarly, Nepal. So Nepal and Bangladesh had leapfrogged India and after 21 years had lower rates of under five mortality. In terms of maternal mortality, um, again, in terms of the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 women, India had reduced it 400. Bangladesh 560, and Nepal 600. In terms of immunization, for example, in DPT, you can look at the different ones. We didn't cherry pick very much. India's immunization rates went up to 72% of children were immunized at the correct time for DPT, but 96% in Bangladesh, 92% in Nepal. And finally, female literacy from the age of 15 to 24, um, again, was had started higher in India and started lower in Bangladesh and Nepal, but ended up higher in Bangladesh and Nepal than in India. So this raised, you know, it's just an empirical question again, uh, but it's over a bit of a time period, 21 years, um, and so it, it suggests that it's not simply the level of growth; it's also the social policies, the investments in in other sectors 
that might be responsible. And I think rather than seeing it as a sad story, seeing it as a happy story, that countries like Bangladesh and in Nepal that are low income countries managed to make such tremendous gains. And neither country, I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but neither country is free of corruption totally. Um, uh, but still they were able to make documented gains in the non-monetary indicators. So again, that creates a curiosity um, which, and, and space. And there were some strong statements in this regard um, in the paper that I cited earlier by Bourguignon and co-authors, co um, where in their studies they did find that the correlation between growth, again, this is a simple correlation, and we will, you can talk with either Schumann or Buba about growth elasticities of various types, um, and Anavaj. But uh, in their paper, they found that the correlation between growth and improvements in non-income MDGs is practically zero. And they didn't think that um, the non-income MDGs were so affected by measurement error that their data were pure noise. So there must be some kind of independence among the policies that govern progress in the different MDGs. And so you probably need sectoral policies, Oops. <coughs> sectoral policies <coughs> as well as growth to address those. So at the bottom of the line in our search to make life easy for ourselves and look at growth as the only policy for reducing the different dimensions of income, it doesn't seem that it's a sufficient guide. And so we're back to the search for better measures. So in the last um, section of this part, um, I thought that I would just show, I know this is leaping ahead a little bit, um, so I won't go through actually how these different measures are constructed, but I thought I would show you a little bit of the relationship between income and multidimensional poverty indices, where these multidimensional poverty indices I will show have different indicators in them. Some of them include income inside. They are research projects, they are papers, they are the global <laughs> MPI. But I wanted to go with one last question, which was to say, if we put everything together in a multidimensional poverty index, are we making income obsolete? Are we then actually getting the same information that we might get with an income poverty measure? So is it the same in the matter that a multidimensional poverty index would be a standalone measure um, and replicate the information from income poverty? And we're going to ask that same question in terms of level, uh, trend, and growth. So we're going to look at when you compare the MPI, which is basically a poverty gap and adjusted headcount ratio, and income poverty, you have to use the headcount ratio. So you're comparing headcount ratios and headcount ratios. I know tomorrow we're going to tell you why not to use the headcount ratio, but today we are, okay? So just <laughs> forgive our hypocrisy. And then we're going to look at the trends, then the micro match um, of who's poor by the different measures, and then rates of growth and MPI reduction. So just focus in a little bit, fast forwarding to when you have made an MPI and see are you still going to add value to an income poverty measure if income is not or if income is in the MPI. So let's start just with a descriptive. This is the headcount ratios of poverty by multidimensional, which is pink, and income, which is blue in Bhutan, according to their districts. And they are ranked in the level of multidimensional poverty. So what you can see is that, again, they don't walk in lockstep. So Gaza is quite interesting because it's the country with the, high, the, the district with the highest level of MPI and hardly any income poverty. And the reason is that they have something called cordyceps. Who knows what cordyceps are? I didn't either. But it used to be a caterpillar, and now it's a fungus in, that goes inside a caterpillar, and it has properties for cancer and other things. But it's part of Chinese traditional medicine, as I understand it. And what you do is you go up on the mountains in the tundra, in the extreme cold, and you pick these things at a certain season of the year. Um, and then you sell them at amazingly high prices. And that's what they do in the high tundra of Gaza, which only is, you know, is inhabited by yaks otherwise. And so they have lots of money. But I was with the Bhutan GNH team when they had just done the latest GNH survey in 
in Gaza, and it was 11 days' walk um, to reach Laya. Um, so there's no roads, there's no hospitals, there's no schools. So the social facilities are, are, are not present. And so it's an example of, of really the mismatch. What one captures is income, and that's true, and it means they can buy lots of rice, they can go to Punacha, and they can you know, enjoy a good life. But then when they go back, you know, if they have a health catastrophe, if their kids uh, need schooling, they, they can't do that. Um, and then on the other hand, there's some like Kyunsa or Pemagatsen that are income poor, but have relatively low multidimensional poverty. So in a sense, it's like having two eyes, I think, because I, I, I think they are complementary. I don't think one's right and one's wrong. With two eyes, you can see in 3D, and you don't pour your tea behind your teacup. You pour your tea into the teacup. So you can sort of see it better. Um, here's the thing you may be familiar with, which is the headcount ratio of MPI from very low to very high levels in countries. And the black dots are the $1.25 a day income poverty lines. And these are for um, the countries where the income surveys were fielded within three years of the MPI surveys. But you can see that in a few countries, they actually match. And a lot match down here with low poverty. But then there are some that don't. Um, there's some that are really different. Um, and so it, it may be data errors, it may be, but it also may be that using the measures together gives you a better oversight uh, of what's going on in the countries. But clearly, you're not replicating the information. So to go back to our question, are you adding information by doing an MPI? And the global MPI doesn't include income. Bhutan's does not include income. Um, it does seem that it's not the same information that's presenting. If we look at trends, so this is the rate of reduction of the headcount ratio of multidimensional poverty in brown or maroon and of income poverty by $1.25 a day in orange. And for Nepal, they're the same. I thought there was another. They're close in Pakistan. But in many of them, they're different. And in some cases, multidimensional poverty is higher. In Rwanda, for example. And in some cases, like Niger, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Mali, income poverty reduction is higher. So the trends, again, are not they're ordered in terms of MPI, but the biggest reduction in, in income poverty was in Niger, which hardly reduced its MPI between 2006 and 2012, but these are analyzed, analyzed data. So we're not replicating the trends. Again, um, in the tables you can see, well, for income poverty we don't have statistical significance, we don't have standard errors, but for MPI you always need to check it with the standard errors to see if it's significant, but I don't know how to do that for $1.25 a day. And then we can go within countries. This is work Shimon and I um, have done. Um, so uh, it's a regression um, looking at the change in the monetary headcount ratio and per annum. And the, the, they're not exactly the same years, but they're a similar time frame and the starting level of, multi of monetary poverty. So these are the places that had high monetary poverty, and this is their rate of reduction where down is better, so you, it's a race to the bottom, so the faster is better. So you see that in monetary terms, um, the poorest states had a faster reduction in monetary poverty than the least poor states. So this is Manipur, that's Mizoram, just to give examples. But when you look at the MPI between 1999 and 2006, this is the starting level of poverty, so Bihar is the highest. And this is the rate of reduction. So actually you see the opposite, that um, within India, the states with the highest level of multidimensional poverty had the slowest level of reduction, and those with lower levels had a higher level of reduction. So we're not seeing the same trends, not only across countries, but also within countries. And that's important because the comparisons are much more rigorous within countries. So you don't have to trouble about different years, different periods, different variable definitions. So again, you're raising questions, but, but the, the clear answer to my, my problem of whether we are replicating information is, is no, that, that it's, it's adding different information. So, I'm not going to talk, and we will talk later about the national versus the global MPIs. I just wanted to end with two 
um, a little bit more applied moments in this introductory session about the demand for new metrics. Um, and first is to just acknowledge that um, the MPI, for example, in, 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 when it was launched a global measure, which compares over 100 uh, developing countries, got quite a bit of media coverage. So there was just some interest in finding out a measure that stood alongside income, a sister measure, but tried to bring into view um, some de definitions of poverty that are, are complementary to income. And so it, it perhaps suggests that it's not too confusing um, and it is possible um, to, and to give a headline measure, which might not be possible for a dashboard, as we'll talk about later. But then I think for us, what has been a tremendous learning experience has been the interaction with national governments. Um, and so OFI were privileged to work with, and James Foster, um, with the government of Mexico um, early on as we were developing the methodology. And Mexico launched their national MPI in 2009, Bhutan in 2010, Colombia in 2011. Um, and so there have been a, a series of governments who develop multidimensional measures. And so by 2013, the demand was a little bit big. Um, so we got a network of South-South collaboration um, so that people could talk with each other um, and, and learn from each other. So it's meant people from Mexico and Colombia and us and somewhere else flying to China. It's meant people from Lucifer and Africa going to Brazil. It's meant, you know, but basically different kinds of interchanges of experiences. And so there's a network, and, and the problem with these things is, is that then they go and launch themselves in places that are not poor, like Oxford. <laughs> um, so uh, it was with the Martisan, and it's very elitist when you, when you do it, um, which is very odd. But um, it's basically tried to bring elite people, so ministers, heads of states, um, vice presidents, together, and to give them a forum to really talk passionately about poverty and think about how to use measures to reduce it. So these are not necessarily the statisticians. There's some statisticians like Pali Lehola from South Africa, fantastic dynamic person who's involved. But this is really trying to go outside the metrics geeks like us into the government folks and really engage and learn how they will use this um, so that we can design measures that they can actually use. And some of you in ministries of planning or whatever will, will know what I'm talking about. Some numbers just aren't useful. And then alongside this, the network has um, brought to the attention of a wider community in the UN um, how both the global MPI and national MPIs can support the ongoing discussions around sustainable development goals. So we've had side events in the UN General Assembly. The first one had 100 people. We had another meeting with now a lot more countries in Berlin. Um, we had another meeting now with 300 people. So it's, it, it's getting bigger. We've had, I think, various um, side events at the UN Citizens Commission um, and we'll be having both events again this year. And what those do is they basically act as a way of you know, hearing different country experiences. Um, and these are now a much wider group of countries that have adopted national poverty measures. But hearing their experiences and then also having other countries that may not, you know, may be curious but may be very critical or may just be interested but non-committal about it, um, be exposed to what multidimensional poverty measures are. So our most recent one was in Colombia and Cartagena with President Santos again um, and a group of folks now from nearly 40 countries and 10 international institutions. Um, and so that set of activities and set of actors who have voices that some tired academic doesn't have have been able to raise the issue in the sustainable development goals about the need for a headline indicator of non-monetary poverty, of multidimensional poverty to stand alongside the $1.25 a day measure. And here are some reasons that they have found that they support, an MPI supports the SDG agenda. One is that that agenda wants to break silos. It wants to look at integrated and coordinated policies. And the reason it wants to do so is that it found in the course of the Millennium Development Goals that the countries that made the fastest progress in reducing the MDGs took an integrated policy approach, and so that was more effective and cost-effective. A second is they want it to be able to be disaggregated by groups, um, so by the disabled or by subnational regions, by rural urban. And um, $1.25 a day poverty can't at the moment be disaggregated 
um, to my knowledge, regularly by rural and urban or by ethnic groups or by subnational groups because it's, it's a global measure. And so your, your PVPs are done at the national level and not necessarily by, by the different regions. Um, and the MPI, as we'll see, can be a global measure or national measures can be completely disaggregated because, in a sense, thus far, the definitions have been the same across all populations. Um, and so there, there are some needs from that agenda. This is also called leave no one behind. Um, and although we focused on acute poverty, um, we've also done a measure with European data, but it's also, of course, po possible, and I was interested in the middle income work, it's possible to do a measure of moderate poverty um, in, in high income countries. Um, so, and, and we've looked at the data needs for a better MPI that would better reflect the SDGs, and it does seem doable. Um, so I'll just leave you with the slides, I'm not gonna present them because it would take too much time, but just some slides about how there could be a better global MPI to measure acute poverty, and how there could also be an MPI um, for the countries that um, either have such low poverty, like Latin America or the Arab states, um, many of the Arab states, not all of them, um, that they would like a different definition of MPI, or they don't have an MPI at the moment, like the industrialized countries. And so finally, let, let me just place it for you as to where the proposal, which is currently under discussion, is to put national and or global MPIs in the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals will be agreed together with their targets in the General Assembly of September. The indicators will be finalized in March 2016 at the UN Statistics Commission. So I don't know if this is the final list, but this is the proposal which came out of the Open Working Group and was endorsed by the Secretary General in his December report. Um, and there are 17 goals, and the number of targets varies a little bit, but there are a lot. So, but the first goal is to end poverty in all its forms anywhere. I'll mention in a moment that the South African, no, the, the African statisticians have observed that an MPI covers goals one to eight and 10 of the, MDG, of the SDGs. So they think it's a good headline indicator. Um, this is the same indicators, but just in simpler words, so you can sort of see what they are, because the font was too small. Um, and the Open Working Group has targets, and target two is to end poverty in all its dimensions. And they say according to national definitions, which might be like national income poverty lines, national MPIs. Although because that will take so long, um, others have suggested that at least initially an, a global MPI also be constructed. So that was July 2014. December, the UN Secretary General released his report um, and observed that one of the gaps of the Millennium Development Goals was an indicator that looked who is deprived in everything at the same time. Looked at this joint distribution of deprivations, which is what the multidimensional poverty does. And he suggested that that needs to be, that needs to fill the gap uh, of measurement in the SDGs and that when we think of funding to countries, it should also consider MPI, not just income poverty. And that, in particular, poverty measures need to reflect the multidimensional nature of poverty as well as income poverty. So there's quite a lot of discussion going on at these stratospheres of politics about what we're discussing. Um, then there was the 69th session of the UN, um, which passed a resolution um, underline the need to better reflect the multidimensional nature of de development and poverty and look at measurement that better reflect multidimensionality. So, so this message is coming up in those documents. Um, and then there was a preliminary is list of proposed indicators in February. And this included an MPI, um, which was actually more of a global MPI. Um, and also um, it mentioned that capacity of countries was even uneven and that if we were gonna make an individual rather than a household-based MPI with the, that as the unit of identification, you need individual le level record data. Um, in May 6th, there was a financing for development report 
again, which argued that the UN need to better measure and um, recognize the multidimensional nature of poverty. Um, and then the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is the group by Jeff Sachs, which reports to the Secretary General on measurement, has in all of its reports proposed a global MPI um, to measure target two of the SDGs. And they actually suggest it should be very similar to the existing MPI. They're not very revolutionary, whereas we wanted you know, gender and work and violence and different things to go into it. Um, they would like something very much like what already exists. Um, so they wanted to drop flooring of housing and have the other nine ind indicators. And then there's a, a, this group in South Africa in, in May 2015 um, that also proposes uh, an MPI. Um, and as I mentioned, articulated as reflecting some of the SDGs. There's a draft list of indicators which will be launched, which will be released on August 11th um, from the interagency working group that's going to finalize the sustainable development goal indicators. So I just thought, although we are now going to ignore all of that world and focus on the techniques, it's good to know that that world is existing and talking and may give you a job, <laughs> uh, you students, um, in the future. Just because it's, it's quite an interesting time, and we don't know how it will go. Um, we don't know what role OP would have, what role national governments will be called upon to have. Um, but it's, it's certainly a time where these issues have a wider life than just in the kinds of heavy academic books <laughs> that we work on. So that's what I wanted to present, and, and finally, because I like the book, um, end with a, a quote that clearly the reason we do this is not to get in some international list and not to get a measure. Um, but it's uh, to, to support actions that actually fight poverty. So that's hopefully all of our personal motivation for being part of this. <laughs>